Our scripture this morning comes from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. We have been studying Bible prophecy for many weeks in our, Tuesday, in our Wednesday and Thursday night, sorry, Wednesday night and Thursday morning classes. And uh, this past Wednesday and Thursday, I mentioned that we weren't going to spend a lot of time on chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation in the Bible prophecy class because those, those, quite frankly, don't have as much of the juicy prophecy in them than some of the other chapters were, that they lent themselves more to uh, Sunday morning as, as uh, the Apostle John is writing his letters to the various churches. So we're going to consider one of those letters this morning to the church in Ephesus, and that's uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the letters written to the churches many years ago that have application even for us today. I pray as a body of believers that we would have open ears and open hearts to what you have to say to us through your word. Help us to measure ourselves against that which you have said and stated, and help us to repent and draw near to you and be convicted where it is necessary. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not at all uncommon nowadays to see someone out running or jogging for exercise. We see it all the time. We don't even think about it, but really, uh, that's a relatively new thing. It's only been, been a few decades, but back before the early 70s, you almost never saw anyone running for exercise or jogging alongside the road. That craze really took off in the early 70s when a man wrote a book. The man's name was Jim Fix, and he wrote a book about the, the benefits of running, and it caught fire, and the craze caught fire, and people started running more and more for their health, and it's been a common thing ever since. It was not begun by Forrest Gump, as is popularly imagined, uh, but by the man named Jim Fix. And so everyone was uh, quite surprised on the day in 1984 when Jim Fix himself collapsed while jogging and died at the age of 53. And some suggested, well, all that he said was, was wrong about running. It wasn't that helpful at all. And some said, no, he, he, uh, he lived longer than his father, who, who died of a heart attack at age 43, and he might not have lived as long as he had had he not been running and exercising. But But the point that I'd like for us to take from that today is sometimes by all outward appearances, everything is healthy, but there might be something on the inside that has not been identified, maybe something like a ticking time bomb that needs to be found and that needs to be addressed. And that is true for us, spiritually speaking. The church in Ephesus, by all appearances, was very solid and spiritually sound. It was founded by Priscilla and Aquila, and Paul had preached there for a while. Timothy had preached there for a while. Even the apostle John himself had come and made his home in Ephesus and spent a lot of time with that congregation, and that was his home base. And uh, you would think that they had it all together, but we can see from this letter, and we can see from the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians, that even so, there were things that needed to be addressed, things that needed to be taken care of, and if not, it would be to their great peril. So we're going to consider this morning the letter written to another church. We're going to read somebody else's mail again, but we're going to be able to find, I do believe, application for ourselves today. He says there in verse 2, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write. Now the angels of the churches 
were just the ministers. The word angel simply means messenger. Often the same Greek word is translated. Sometimes it's angel, sometimes it's messengers. And, and so these letters are simply being written to the ministers who were dealing with them at this time, to the angel of the church, to the minister, to the one who's going to speak to him, write these words. And in verse 1 it continues, The words of him who holds the step, seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, if you're not sure what he's talking about with the stars and lampstands, we're sorry that you missed on Wednesday night and Thursday morning. The, the lampstands are the churches, as explained in chapter 1 of Revelation. The stars are the ministers that the Lord holds in his hand. He holds the ministers in his hand, and he walks among the churches. And one of the things that that teaches us is that Jesus is very interested in what takes place in the church. He walks among the churches as, as if a man walks through his garden and he looks at his plants and he looks at his flowers or he looks at his vegetation and he, he assesses whether it's healthy, whether it's producing, what needs to be pruned, what needs things added to it. And Jesus himself is very interested in what takes place in the churches. We must never, when we think of the church, sort of categorize it mentally in the same in the same place as, say, the Rotary Club, or the Moose Lodge, or the Friends of the Library, or the PTA. Now, what they all have in common, people gather together based on a particular issue or theme, and that's what we do. We get together based on what Christ has done for us. But the church is a high and holy institution, and the Lord constantly has his eye on it. And he is assessing, and he is looking, and he is giving instructions, and he is watching how it is that we put into place what he says. Now, as we get into verse 2, those of you who are in the reproof business, you might want to take note of how he does this, starting in verse 2 and in the other letters to the churches. By the reproof business means sometimes you have to offer correction. Maybe you're a parent. Or maybe you're a teacher. Maybe you're a boss or a manager. Sometimes there needs to be correction. Well, we find some interesting example from Jesus as he does this in these letters to these seven churches. He starts with something about which he can commend them and say, I like this, what you're doing. And then he moves on to say, but this, here's where we have a difficulty. Here is something that needs to be addressed. He says there in verse 2, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. Now we stop right there. Those are things that any church would like the Lord to be able to say about them. I know your works, and I commend your works. I know your toil. That you know that the work of Christ is not for those who don't want to get their hands dirty. It's not for those who don't want to break a sweat. That there is toil, there is labor. That's why we find so many verbs in Scripture that you must strive and that you must, you must work in order to, to maintain faithfulness and obedience. I know your endurance. I like that how you cannot bear with those who are evil. Apparently the church in Ephesus was very good at church discipline. And when they found that someone was engaged in sinful behavior and it was, bringing, uh, it, was, it was bringing ill to the reputation of the church that they addressed it according to the things that had been told and maybe ended up speaking to someone as, and, and regarding them as a tax collector and a sinner. The church at Ephesus was very careful to guard their morality, to guard their doctrine. What a wonderful, stable church it is and appears to be. It says, you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Think about what that means. Suppose I went up to a stranger, and I said, how do you do? My name is Tom Hanks. They might say, really? Well, that's cool. There is a well-known actor by the name of Tom Hanks. And I say, no, I am the Tom Hanks. I am the actor Tom Hanks. They say, no, you're not. I know you're not. No, I am, really. No, you're not. I know you're not. How do you know I'm not? Well, because I have seen, I've seen movies with Tom Hanks. I've seen Tom Hanks on TV, and I've seen his picture in magazines. I've heard his voice. You are not Tom Hanks. I say, okay, you got me there. What can I say? All right, I'm not Tom Hanks. Well, back in the first century, they did not have the benefit of television and movies and pictures in the newspaper, and, and the apostles 
were not necessarily very well known in all areas. There were people back at that time who not only wrote letters like books of the Bible and put apostles' names on them as if the apostle had written it when they had not, sometimes they would go to a place and say, yes, I am apostle so-and-so, and I'm here to teach you. Well, the church at Ephesus, they knew their doctrine. They were solid, and they were steady, and they tested them, and they asked questions, and they were able to say, there is no way you are the apostle that you claim to be. And so they would not let them up to speak or to, or to spread false doctrine in their church. Jesus goes on in verse 3, I know you are enduring patiently, bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Wouldn't it be great for Jesus to be able to say about our congregation the things that he has said about the church of Ephesus up to this point where we have read. And yet, we have that conjunction, that transitional word there at the beginning of verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Now, the language John is using is kind of like honeymoon language. Some, some places it's translated as you have lost your first love. Now, if you're married, you know what this is talking about. You know how in the very beginning there's just this giddiness, there's this excitement, there's this I cannot wait to see, I cannot wait to hear from, I cannot wait to speak to my special uh, other, my significant other. And, and that is the kind of that is the kind of thing that happens when a person becomes a new believer. Yes, there is that excitement. I cannot wait to read the scripture. I cannot wait to get with others and pray. I cannot wait to fellowship. And apparently what had happened is that this church who was so involved in all of these delightful, grounded activities, those were all things that they could go through and do lovelessly. They could do those things without much affection. You can, you can guard the doctrine of your church, but not do so with love and affection. You can, you can maintain a high moral standard of character and behavior and test uh, someone who claims to be an apostle. You can do all those things with a decided lack of, of affection and a lack of feeling. And I wonder if how many, how many churches there are about whom the Lord could say the same of us. It was a very serious thing that you had abandoned the love that you had at first. Now he gives a three-point solution to this in verse 5. Three little verbs right there at front. You want to solve this problem, it's what you do. First of all, you remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. In other words, you remember the way it was in the beginning. The way it was when you first knew the Lord. Just like you might remember the way it was when you first met your significant other. Do you remember the, the passion and the, and the zeal? And you have a desire then to rekindle that. You remember those things. When the prodigal son came to the end of himself, the Bible says he remembered the way it was at the house that he had left. He remembered that even the servants there. They have food to eat and they have clothes to wear. They have much more than what I have. Remember Therefore, compare where you are now to the peace of mind that you had, to the clear conscience that you had, the love and affection that you had in the beginning in order to recapture it. He also says there in verse 5, repent and do the works that you did at first. Repent, grieve inwardly about it. Again, the prodigal son grieved inwardly about it. He said, I will rise up. I will go back to my father and I will ask for his forgiveness. I will ask him to make me a servant in his household. Those were acts of repentance. And then he says, do the works that you did at first. Okay, you're doing wonderful works, good, solid, scholarly, uh, scriptural works in the things that you're doing. But what about those works of love? What about when you, when you prayed with one another? What about when you prayed for one another. What about when you did acts of mercy for one another? When you did acts of hospitality for one another? I don't know about you, but I can testify that sometimes when I feel cold and distant from the Lord, the best thing is just to close the door, find a time alone, and just, and just pray to Him. You can get on your knees or fall prostrate before Him and pour out your heart. That is a good 
exercise to do to help to recapture the, the affection and the zeal that is waning when it's lost. You know, I could go back to, that, to, the, uh, to the other side of that building and grab the, uh, grab the vacuum cleaner. And I could push that vacuum cleaner over every inch of carpet that's in the other end of this building. But if I don't have it plugged in, then I've just wasted my time. There's some things that are basic that your actions are worthless without. And love for the Christian is one of them. I've heard before the, uh, the illustration used of a baseball game where somebody will miss first base. But boy, will they, with great speed, will they round second and round third and gloriously slide into home plate, none of which matters. Because they missed first base. First base for us is having love and affection for our Lord and for his people. The lack of which makes everything else we do worthless before him. Moving ahead to verse 7. This shows. I'm sorry. I, 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 let me finish verse 5. He says, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. It's so serious to the Lord. What he says to the church in Ephesus. That wonderful, famous, seemingly vibrant church. If you don't repent of this lack of love and affection as the basis for the works that you will do. I will shut down the church. I don't know exactly what that means. Maybe he would remove the place and remove the people from it. Maybe he would simply remove his presence from it. Maybe they would maintain the keys. And maybe they would still enter into the building on a regular occasion. And yet the Lord would be absent from them because they did not repent of their lack of love and affection upon which needed to be based all of the works that they do. That shows us what a serious and necessary thing it is for us to have love and affection for the Lord and for his people in the things that we do. Now to verse 7. It says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's present tense to them. And it's present tense to us today. We need to have ears to hear what the Spirit says to us in his church. Whatever one may think about the church and what the role the church should play in modern times. What kind of programs, what kind of things shall we be do? What kind of activities and this and that. We know from scripture that one of the primary functions of the church is to mold and shape the people from the word of God. And we can do nothing better with our ears than to give heed to the word of God. We can do no more Give no more respect to the church and its function than when we gather together and we feast upon the word of God and allow him to speak to us the words that we need to hear so that we may draw near to him. He says to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. It's not good enough to do very well up to a point and yet fall short to the end. He was writing to people who were who are suffering and would be suffering great persecution. And it's the kind of persecution with which we are not yet familiar here. But we still have the danger of falling short and not making it to the finish line with the faith that we need to have and the obedience that shows that we have a living faith in the Holy Spirit living inside of us. A lawyer came to Jesus once and he said, he asked him a question. He asked him a question to test him. He said, what is the greatest commandment? Well, that's a pretty good question. He's saying, Jesus, why don't you sum up all of Scripture into a nice little sound bite uh, that, that we can take with us? And, and the Lord did. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That is of the utmost importance for us. We need to regard the words to the church of Ephesus. Let us be about the business of the things that he found them doing that were commendable. And let us also not be lacking where they were lacking so that we, we need to repent of a lack of love that undergirds the work that is the foundation of the things that we claim to do in the name of the Lord. Let's ask him for his help this morning. We thank you again, Lord, 
for your holy word. We thank you for your instructions. We, we thank you for the example you've given, the love that you have shown. And I pray that you would help us not to let our love grow cold. That you would help us to understand the importance of keeping the flame burning of, of passion and affection for you, for your word, and for your work, and for your people. And I pray that you would help any of us who are here, who need to rekindle, who need to draw near, who need to show love for you, like you deserve to be shown. Help us to do so. Help us to keep it going. Help us as a church to function as you've called us to, that that you'd help us to spur one another to good works and faithfulness, including the love and affection that we need to have for you and for each other. I pray for anyone here this morning, Lord, who has not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, that you'd help them to understand the urgency of this matter and help us to minister to them. We give honor and glory to you and thank you for the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. Every Sunday morning, we offer an invitation for anyone who'd like to come forward and express their desire to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. So we can make arrangements to meet with you and uh, open the word of God and discuss this important matter. If you're a baptized believer, you're not a member of Calvary Christian, you'd like to officially identify with this body, we invite you to come forward, express that desire as well. If you have a spiritual need or like us to pray for you, we invite you to come forward for that as we stand and sing our invitation song this morning.